We've been on a series on Friday nights for some weeks now. We call it Perfect Protection. Perfect Protection. Say that out loud. Perfect, Perfect. Protection. One more time. Perfect protection. In Psalm 4 is our text. It said in the last verse of Psalm 4, Psalm 4, 8, he says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. Do you have to toss and turn? Do you have to take a bunch of drugs to get to sleep and, hmm? Let me go over that again real slow. <laughs> Is it normal to take pills to sleep? No. no, it's not. And you don't need that. And it's not helping you. It hurts you. Hmm? He gives his beloved sleep, the scripture said. You are his beloved. You don't have to have that. You don't need that. And beware of reaching for a pill to give you something that God's already given you. Hmm? Well, I, I'm just too nervous. I, I need a pill to, to make me relax. Just because it's legal and you have a prescription doesn't mean it's okay. That's the same thing the guy says about, you know, emptying a fifth. I need to relax. <laughs> I'm up to that's the same thing people say about smoking joints. Right? I need to mellow. I need to relax. And just because you got a prescription and it's legal doesn't mean it's that much different. Did you know we are living in a medicated generation? Oh, we're having fun right off the bat here, aren't we? Praise God. Now, if we paint your picture, just look straight ahead and smile and go, amen, Brother Keith. Somebody needs to hear that. Because if you get all sour and tense, then everybody will know. <laughs> so you don't understand, Brother Keith. I, I have a, a chemical imbalance. I, I have clinical depression. Oh, clinical. Always why didn't you say so? <laughs> the joy of the Lord is your strength. Peace I give to you, Jesus said. Not like the world gives, give I unto you. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be afraid. You cast all your care over on him, he will keep you in perfect peace. The peace of God that passes understanding will keep your heart and your mind and you won't need pills. Hmm? Do you believe this or not? It's too easy to, to use crutches. And just because it's accepted in society doesn't mean it's okay with the Lord. Have you asked him about this? Have you asked him about this self-medication? Hmm? Well, so, well, it's my body. No, it's his. It's his. He bought it. He paid for it. You say, well, you don't understand, Brother Keith. I can't make it without it. That's what you believe. That's what you say. And that's what you've locked yourself into. But God could heal you. Well, I got a glandular problem. God can heal glands. I got a chemical imbalance. He can balance it. <laughs> he's got the chemicals and he's got the balance. <laughs> huh? How many believe God can fix anything? Do you believe it or not? Come on, believe it now. He's got the real solution. I mean, you can take drugs till you pass out and come to seven, eight, ten hours later. 
That doesn't mean you slept. It means you're in a semi-comatose state. Doesn't mean you've rested. Did you hear me now? Doesn't mean you've read, you get up in, in worse shape and more draggy than before you laid down. No, he gives his beloved sleep. And this man said, I will both lay me down in peace and I'm going to sleep. I'm going to sleep like a baby. I'm going to wake up refreshed and renewed. Why? For you, Lord, only Make me dwell in safety. One reason so many people are taking so many pills is because they're not right. They're not right with God. Their life is not right. Their conscience is bothering them. Did you hear me? They're in sin and they refuse to repent. And so they're not right. And so they try to avoid it. They try to eat their way to forgetting it. They try to drink their way or, or take pill, anything to make it go away. Well, I got to make the pain go away. You ain't supposed to have pain like that. Why is the pain there? The pain's telling you there's a problem. Are you with me now? Need to get forgiveness. Need to receive your forgiveness. Need to forgive yourself. Forgive other people. Right? Believe God has forgiven you like he said he would. Right? And get peace. And, get, and be at peace with God. And get a clear conscience. And get a clear heart. Get right with your husband. Hmm? Admit your lies. Did you hear me? Get right with your wife. Quit covering stuff. Quit hiding stuff. And you won't need the pills anymore. Well, it's true. And the good news is, you can be free. You can be completely forgiven. Your heart can be completely clear. Your conscience can be clear. I don't care if somebody, you don't, somebody says, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. You can get free. Yeah, but you don't know what I've done, Brother Keith. You don't know how bad it is. You don't know how serious it is. Yeah, and you don't know the power of the blood. I don't care what you've done. It's not more powerful than the blood. It's not greater than God's forgiveness and grace and strength and help. Other people have been worse off than you and got through it and got clear and got free and got forgiven, if you'll believe it. But you can't hide stuff. The Bible says, he that hides his sin shall not prosper. But if you'll confess it and forsake it, you'll get mercy. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Mer somebody say mercy. mercy. How will you get mercy? Confess it. What does that mean? Admit it. Acknowledge it. And what? Quit it. Forsake it. But what if you hide it? You won't prosper. You, you can't make progress. You won't get your mercy. You won't get your grace. Why? Because you're trying to pretend it's not there. You're lying and hiding and covering. And so that's why people have to take pills to try to get, get off to sleep because their, their mind and their conscience is just chewing them and bothering them and they toss and they turn and they know stuff is not right. And they know there are these walls between them and their spouse and their family and their loved ones. And they've told these lies. And then they told another 50 lies to try to cover the lies that they told the last time. And it never ends. And people are suspicious. And even if they, know, they don't know what it is, they know something's not right. And they're getting too close. And so you lay there and you toss and you turn. And you finally self-medicate to try to get some kind of rest and sleep. That ain't no life. I know that's poor English, but I said it on purpose. That is no life. Don't look for your sleep in a pill bottle. Don't look for your peace in a bottle or a pill. Hmm? You're a believer. I said you're a believer. 
You got peace in Jesus. Right? He's already given his beloved sleep. You got victory in him. But you got to do what you know to do. Come clean. Get it right. Repent. Repent doesn't just mean feel bad about it. Repent means change. Change. Well, I can't quit saying that. I've tried and I just, I, I keep doing it. Quit saying that. Quit saying that. Ask God to help you, but give him something to work with. I said, give him something to work with. You know, people pray, oh, God, help me. Please, God, help me. This is such a mess. Please help me. But they don't mean that. They're saying that, but they don't mean that. What they mean is, God, do it for me. Make me do it. And he's not. You know, what if I said, you know, guys, would y'all come and help me move this pulpit? Guys, y'all come help me. And so, you know, some of the ushers get up and start that way, and I come sit down. Yeah, y'all help me. Well, I didn't say that right then, did I? No, you didn't. I'm wanting you to do it for me. Uh-huh. If I'm saying help me, what does that mean? Yes. Help me implies I'm going to be doing something. Yes. And you are going to assist me do what I'm doing. Yes. I got to do something to give you something to help. If you really technically did what I asked, if I said, guys, come help me. And if I go sit down, then what do you do? Yes. You come sit down because that's what I'm doing. And you are assisting me in my sitting. Yes. <laughs> well, people begging and praying God, they're not doing anything. They're unwilling to do anything, so there's nothing to help. Yep. What they're really saying is, God, do it for me. God, make me do it. Make me quit lying. Make me quit stealing. Make me quit overspending. Make me quit. He's not going to make you quit. He's not going to smile. I wish God would just take me over and just control me. If I could just turn this brain off, God, just possess me. Take me. God's not the devil. (laughs) It's the devil that wants to possess you and control you against your will. No, no, no. He didn't make you a, a robot, a puppet, something to be controlled. No, you've got to yield your will to him. And if you want to help him to help you, you got to give him something to help. Amen. You got to be willing to do something. Yes. Right? Yes. Give him something. Give him something to work. Give him your heart. Give him your will. Give him your words. Right? Yes. And reach out yes. to do it. Make an effort to do it. Yes. And when you do, his help will be there. When you reach the end of your ability to do it, you'll meet his power. It'll make up the difference. But you can't just sit and lay crying, feeling sorry for yourself. God, you know, make me do it. That's that's not how it works. Not how it works. Read the verse again with me, please. Last verse, what does it say? I will both lay me down in peace, and I'm going to do what? I'm not I'm going to pass out from substances. I, I'm going to sleep. 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 You know, just going without sleep will make you a different person. It will. It'll, it'll make you different from what you're supposed to be. Just, just going night after night and day after day and not getting adequate sleep. And we, we have an epidemic of this because people, instead of sleeping, they're, they're watching TV all night, they're on the computer all night. Do you hear me? Instead of sleeping. And then they've they got no, no patience, short tempers, they're ill, they're irritable, and, and acting like they don't know why. Huh? I need help, I need this, I need medication. Well, you need to go to sleep. You need to turn that stuff off and go to sleep. (laughs) That lady one time wanted me to pray, actually wanted me to cast the spirit of slumber (laughs) off of her because she never could go to church. She's always sleeping through and not getting to church. 
and want to know if I had the power and the anointing to cast the spirit of slumber out of her. <laughs> well, why do people gravitate to this kind of thing? Because people like what I call no-fault religion. What does that mean? It's not my fault. The spirit of slumber has got me, and I can't get out of bed and make it to work on time. Can't get out of bed and, and make it to church. And, and actually, it was it was two ladies. They were telling me basically the same thing after a service one time, and and uh, I said, "Well, before we pray." <laughs> I said, uh, let me just ask you a couple of simple questions here. I said, uh, Saturday night, what time did you get in the bed? They looked at me like I'd slapped them, like, what's that got to do with anything? It's my personal private life you're, you're delving into. You know, that's why a lot of people don't go to church and they're not faithful in a church. Because they know people will learn them. People will find out who they are. And they can't play their games with them. So they just hop from place to place to place so they can keep pretending. But that's not how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to be a part of a family yes. where people do know you. Yes. And they call you on your goofy stuff. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> they know when it's real and when it's not. And you can't con people because they've been around you too long. But see, a lot of folks don't like that, so that's why they keep hopping and running and moving. I said, what time did you get in the bed Saturday night? They said, well, it was late. I said, how late? I don't know. I said, give me a ballpark time. How late? Midnight? No, it was later than that. Okay. One, two, what? Yeah, it's probably about 2.30, 3. I said, so you're, you're up praying all night? No. Reading the Bible. No. Ministering with somebody. Sitting up with some other. No. I said, how about watching TV? Yeah. I said, well, before we pray and try to use any faith on this, I said, uh, just next Saturday. Go to bed Saturday night at 8.30. Just turn off the TV. Turn off everything. And go to bed at 8.30 and see if you can get up in time to make it to church. So people want to play games, don't they? Cast out the spirit of slumber, Brother Keith. What? It's not my fault. I can't help it. I need it. I got to have this because I can't. No, no. You're violating principles in God's word. Natural laws. You can't just make a confession and ignore all that. Right? Faith is not just fix it when it's all messed up. <laughs> Obey God every day. And you won't have so many things that need fixing. Y'all with me or not? <laughs> You do not have to live on pills. Don't get aggravated with me. Ask the Lord what he thinks about it. Your body has been bought with a price. It belongs to him. What, what did he say about it? Hmm? it? Did he say it was okay for you to put all, put all that stuff in your body night and day? You need, need to ask him about it. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise <laughs> don't, get, get, don't get upset about it. Get happy that you don't have to live that way. You can be free. All things are possible to him that believes. You can be free from that. You can live a different lifestyle. You can actually wake up early in the morning, rested and refreshed with a sunny disposition. You. It's possible. Come on, now, don't look at me in unbelief like that. It's possible. You could wake up early before the alarm clock goes off 
and just almost jump out of bed and go, glory to God, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to be glad. You could feel good, feel good, have victory. It, it's available to you. If you won't make 50 excuses why you can't, why it's different from you, why you're, you know, circumstances are so different, why you're so different, if you won't do that, you can get free. Somebody said out loud, I can be free. I can live free. I can sleep well without AIDS. I can wake up refreshed. I can live healthy and be strong and be free. I can have a clear conscience. I can be honest and not tell lies. I can get free from the past. I can live free from sin. Thanks be unto God who gives me the victory through my Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. See, the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. The Lord didn't tell you don't sin because he wants to spoil your fun. Sin kills you in different ways, by degrees, doesn't it? It kills you. It kills off things in your life and kills things in you. I've seen people, bless their hearts, they used to be so, you know, full of joy, and bouncy and happy and having a good life and they just turn into a different person. So negative and so down all the time and it's because they won't repent they won't they're unwilling to change somebody say not me not me me. me. I will both verse 8 read it again I will both lay me down in peace and sleep that's different from saying I can't, I can't go to sleep at night. I don't know what's wrong with me. I, just, I, I don't care what t- how tired I am or how, what time I go to bed. I just lay there and I toss and turn and I'm so tired, but I can't sleep. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I, I can't sleep. I've tried everything I know and nothing works. I can't sleep. And I'm getting in a mess because I can't sleep. wonder what would be wrong with that person. What, what, anything? Did you notice that they could change? <laughs> I can't. I can't, I can't sleep. I don't know what's wrong with me. I can't sleep. I've tried everything, and I just, I can't. There's something right up under your nose that you're missing. It's that mouth. <laughs> right? Why don't you say this? You start right here. And say this, and say this only. I don't care if you've been laying there for four hours and your eyes are wide open. You say, I lay myself down in peace and I sleep. Because he gives his beloved sleep. And just lay there and thank God for giving you sleep and rest and that you don't need pills to put you into a comatose state. Just thank God and thank God and lay there and pray in tongues. And, right? Amen. Next thing you know, you'll be waking up. Might have to retrain yourself a little bit since your words have been so stout against yourself for so long, but you can do that. Hallelujah. That's not in my notes anywhere. (laughs) Nothing about a pill or anything else. Why would the Lord have us get into that tonight? Huh? Because He loves you. He don't want you living like you've been living. He doesn't want you hurting like you've been hurting. He wants you to believe him that you can be free. Do you believe him? Another translation of this said, When I lie down, I go to sleep in peace. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe. Hence the title, perfect protection. Uh, We've been studying for some time and we we went and saw how the Bible said in the last days it would be perilous times, dangerous times. 
And, and we've talked about how that all around us is violence. I mean, every day, uh, world news, national news, local news, you hear about robberies and, and rapes and, and murders and, and terrible things so much so that it's, we don't think it's strange to hear it every day. But it's not okay. The world we live in is a dangerous place. And we don't have scripture to stand on to believe that it's all going to become perfectly safe worldwide. We're told it's going to get bad in the last days. Dangerous times. We can see that around us. But our question is, even though you're in the midst of stuff, can God keep you? Yes. Does God have the power? Does he have the ability, is it his will to keep you perfectly safe in the middle of dangerous, perilous situations? You believe it? Somebody say, I believe it. So we've gone to Psalm 91, if you would go on over there now, please. And we've been going through it verse by verse. Didn't intend for this to be uh, an exposition of, of this, but it's turned out to be a verse by verse study of Psalm 91 which is the great psalm of protection, as so many people know it. And we have seen as we study this that there's a Godward side and a manward side. That God has the ability to protect, but there's a, there's a responsibility that we have. We must do our part, and that allows Him to do His part. And so many times when people, something has happened that, you know, that was, shouldn't have happened, a person got cut off in youth or, or midlife, even a believer, a good person, people just try to say, well, we don't know why God does these things, but he took them and, 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 and do not stop to say, maybe we didn't do something. Maybe we missed it somewhere and ignore our responsibility. Psalm 91, are you there? Psalm 91, how does it start out? He that dwells. In the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord. Here's our part. We are to do this as a way of life. For Christianity is called the great confession. How do you get born again? You believe something in your heart and you say something with your mouth, right? Is it important that you say it with your mouth, that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is my Lord? Is that important? It's vital. Why would we think that that's all out the window concerning other areas? If God's going to be, if Jesus is going to be your Lord, you must confess him as your Lord. If he's going to be your healer, what do you think? You must confess him as your healer, just like you do your Savior. If he's going to be your provider, same thing. You must confess Jesus is my provider. He provides for me. My God supplies all my needs according to his riches in glory instead of saying we never have enough. We always behind. I don't know why that happened for them. Nothing good ever happens for me. All that kind of stuff. Well, same thing with God being your protector. You must say of the Lord, He's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my God. I'm trusting in Him to protect me and to keep me. Everybody said out loud, God is my protector. God is my protector. He protects me. He, protects he me. keeps me. Now, when we read on down through here, it says, you say that, and then verse 3, surely he will deliver you from the snare or the trap of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. That's his part. When you say, God, you are my protector, I trust you to keep me, then he does these things for you. Right? Also he said, verse 5, here's our part, you shall not be afraid. Is this our part? Yes. We are not to be afraid. We are not to fear. And that's one of the biggest challenges where you see people fail in this. They say, well, 
Well, why is that such a big deal? Because fear is perverted faith. If you're afraid that you're going to get killed in a car wreck, if you're afraid you're going to drown, you're afraid you're going to smother in a tight place, you're afraid you're going to eat something that's got something bad and deadly and it's going to kill you and hurt you. You're afraid of what's in the air, what's in the water, what's in your food. If you're afraid of it, you're believing in that thing's power to hurt you more than in God's power to protect you. To a, to a believer who has some knowledge, fear is insulting to God. No people hadn't seen it, but it is. When God has come through for you repeatedly and protected you and kept you and met your needs and healed you, and then something comes up and you get afraid again and get in all this fear, it's insulting because you know better. You know you got a God who could protect you and keep you, and for you just to yield to this fear... You're choosing to have more faith in this thing to hurt you than in God's power to protect you. Wrong choice. And it's a spiritual law that what you fear will come on you. Right? It draws the thing to you like a magnet. It opens you up. It makes you susceptible. The Bible said that Jesus, uh, you know, over overcame him that had the power of death and delivered those who all their lifetime through fear of death were subject to bondage. Fear makes you subject to what you're afraid of. It puts you in bondage to that thing. And you see people, they're, they're in bondage. They can't even leave their house for fear of this or that. You know, can't go here, can't do that, can't be a part of this. Always afraid, afraid. They do that to their kids. Teach their kids that. Won't let the kids do anything. Oh, this might happen to you. That might happen to you. There's difference between being led and being afraid. Yes. Yes. Doing something because you're scared. That actually opens the door to the problem. Yes. Our part is to not be afraid. He, he mentions the list here. Verse 5, you shall not be afraid for the terror by night. You will not be afraid for the arrow that flies by day. You will not be afraid of the pestilence that walks in the darkness. You will not be afraid of all the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand will fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You got to talk like this, right? Hmm? And yet you hear Christians, fear is a major part of the vocabulary. Oh, I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid that's going to happen. And I'm afraid this is not going to happen. Well, what about so-and-so? I'm afraid not. What about this? I'm afraid so. <laughs> That's not okay. Fearing is you not doing your part and hindering God from protecting you. Can you see the list here? You won't be afraid of this. You won't be afraid of that. You won't be afraid of the other. You won't be afraid. You'll wax bold and say, if it happens to a thousand over here and 10,000 over here, it won't happen to me. Not because you believe you're superior, because you have faith in your God to keep you and protect you. People say, well, now, now, now. Things happen. And we just don't know why. And you just never know. Well, are they doing their part? Are they, do, are they believing? No. Then it shouldn't be surprising when they're not protected. Right. People, through ignorance, fight for their right to be destroyed. That's true. That's very true. They, do, they fight for their right to stay broke yeah. and to stay sick. Yeah. They do. Get upset with people like me and you. It's ignorant. <laughs> but there's a lot of that around. Keep reading. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you. Now, um, back up to verse 9 is a reiteration of our part. 
You've made the Lord your refuge. You say that he is. And he's keeping you. And one way that he protects you, you know, we, we read the first part. Uh, he covers you with his feathers. Under his wings, you'll trust. We went into, into some detail about that and saw that the example of an eagle or a mother hen is used, that the little ones run up under the wings and the mother covers them. God protects us with a canopy of protection. He has power. He, he has put it over entire groups of peoples. He put it, you know, when the plagues were going through the land of Egypt, he covered the entire land of Goshen with this canopy. Uh, the plague would be going, you know, rampaging through the flocks, the herds, the crops, and it would hit something at that borderline. It'd be like coming to the border between Missouri and Arkansas. There's nothing you can see there, but it would hit something. God had force fields long before Star Trek or whatever, you know, didn't he? God has a, a, a power shield of power and canopy of protection. We see that's one way he protects us. We see he gives his angels charge over us and concerning us and they watch over us they encamp round about us they live with us and around us to deliver us and they have been charged from God to protect us to keep us and they are very mighty they're very powerful we we looked at that and, and read about what they can do and how much even one angel can do your angels came with you tonight they'll go home with you they stay with you right they protect your home. They protect your car. They protect your stuff. They protect you, you, you where, where you're going out and you're coming in. Can you say amen? Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. You need to believe it. You need to say it. Yes. Right? Once in a while, you need to say it. He's given his angels charge over me. They'll bear me up in their hands lest I dash my foot against a stone. They live with me. They encamp round about me. They protect me. They deliver me. You need to say that out loud your mouth. Time to time. Are you with me? It is one of the ways he protects us. But now getting into uh, uh, last week, we got into another area of how he protects us. Would you go to Matthew? Matthew 2. Matthew 2 and verse uh, 12. Talking about uh, Mary and Joseph concerning Jesus, verse 12, being warned of God. Everybody say that out loud. Being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. Skip down to verse 22. You see it again. When he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, notwithstanding being warned of God. Everybody say, warned of God. <laughs> warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. How did God protect Jesus during this part of his life? Warnings. Warnings. And I believe this is one of the principal ways one of the main ways, most common ways that God protects his people is through warnings. Yes. Now, Jesus, as important as he was and is, and his mission was and is, that's how the Father protected him. And the family was through warnings and them taking heed to warnings. Should we require something more spectacular than that? Yes. We should not. Everybody say warnings. warnings. God gives his people warnings. Did you lose your place in Psalm 91? No. Go back there then. Psalm 91. This is our part and his part further. We read verse 11. He'll give his angels charge over you. And uh, 
They'll bear you up in their hands unless you dash your foot against a stone. Verse 13, you'll tread upon the lion, the adder, the young lion, the dragon. You'll trample under feet. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later on. Verse 14, because he has set his love upon me. That's our part. Hmm? Does it matter if you love God? Yes. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, one thing, if you really love God, you're going to be paying attention to God. Aren't you? You're going to be interested in listening to him. Finding out what he's got to say. I will set him on high. Now again, go back to the context of the message. God is my refuge and my fortress. In those days when the people got attacked by an enemy, those that had towers, they would lock everything down and run inside the tower and uh, bar the doors and lock the doors and go up. And if you could get high enough, you get out of the reach of the enemy. Animals do it all the time, don't they? If they can, they can get to the tree and get, get up high, they can get away from the predator so many times. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will what? Verse 14, will I deliver him? I will set him on high, safe, because he has known my name. He will call upon me. What will happen? Are we still talking about protection? Yes. You're, you're under attack. You're in a, a perilous, dangerous situation, and you call on the Lord. And what does he do? You love God. You've confessed, you know, Day in, day out, he's my protector. He's my refuge. His angels keep me and protect me. And something comes up and you say, Lord, I'm calling on you. Help me out of this. And what does he do? I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. And I won't just say I'm with you while you spiral down the drain. Don't forget, I'm with you. Help. I'm with you, remember, just remember, I'm, no, I will be with him, what? I will deliver him, say that out loud, I will deliver him, is that God talking now, what did he say? You do what I've been talking about. You, you, you confess that I am your protector, I am your Lord. You refuse to let fear in. You confess that I, my angels protect you. You call on me in trouble. I will be with you and I will deliver you. Did he say it? Yes. Well, you just never know what God's going to do. He'll do what he said he would do if you'll believe it. What did he say? I will deliver him. I'll do it. Got to believe this. Got to count on this. But now, this, gets, this ties in with what we're talking about. How does he deliver us? See, sometimes people spectacularize this, don't they? They have this, you know, spectacular deliverance in mind and can miss the supernatural. Uh, the Bible said, we read this last time, don't turn there, but 2 Kings 6 says the king of Israel sent to a place which the man of God told him and warned him and saved himself there not once nor twice. Was he delivered? Was his soldiers delivered? Yes. Repeatedly? Yes. Through what? A warning. a warning. I'll be with him and I'll deliver him. Should we understand that many times the Lord's going to deliver us through warning us? Yes. Oh, please get this, friends. Don't, don't let this be too, too common for you. Amen. Yes, there are times when it is such that you need spectacular deliverance. Nothing else is going to work, and God is well able to do that. But again and again, all that's really needed is for him to say, don't go there. Don't hook up with that. Don't be a part of that. Wait half a day. Hmm? Warn you. 
And if you heed it, then did he not deliver you? Didn't he deliver you? I am well convinced, I am persuaded that not one of God's people is cut off through tragedy, through so-called accident or whatever in young, midlife. I'm persuaded that not one time does this happen, but God was warning somebody. Every time. And people say, I just don't understand. Why did God let that happen? I've seen loved ones just sick with grief, but wrong, shaking a fist at God. Why did God let this happen to my baby sister? Why did God let this happen to my mama? Why did God let this happen? I don't understand. Why did God let this happen? That's the wrong question. And yet it's the only one most of the church even knows. And so people try to come and answer that question. Well, baby, we don't know why God saw fit to take your 14-year-old sister. Maybe he just loved her so much that he wanted to be close to her, and he needed her more there than he did here. See, people try to rationalize and reason. It's unscriptural, unbiblical. Did you hear me? And don't realize they're hurting the situation far more than they think. I have seen people, preachers, try to explain this to people in grieving. I saw a young man, he was trying to explain this, you know, uh, well, God just needed another angel in the choir and he just loved her so much. He, he couldn't wait. You know, he took your baby sister and we don't know why. I saw the young man get up and just get hard as nails. And he said, well, if that's the kind of God he is, I don't want anything to do with him. And he stomped out of the door. Didn't go to church again. Well, it's a lie. I said it's a lie. God is not the destroyer. He's not killing teenagers in car accidents. Did you hear me? He's not killing people through violent acts. He's not the killer. He's not the destroyer. There's somebody else around that comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Have you read about it? It's the devil. Yes. But don't give him too much, you know, uh, credit because he can't do anything unless we give him place. Right. The Bible said give no place, no opportunity, no space, no place to the devil. And that's where God, praise God, the Holy Spirit comes in. He will let us know about the devil's traps. He will let us know about these setups. And he'll warn us. And he'll lead us. And if we'll listen and if we'll follow, we'll miss these traps. I said we'll miss these traps again and again. Are you in Psalm 91? Go over to another psalm real quickly here. Glory to God. Psalm 31. 31. Verse 1, I'm going to read this to you from the, today's English version. You can read whatever you got. 31, 1, I come to you, Lord, for protection. Never let me be defeated. You are a righteous God. Save me, I pray. Hear me. Save me now. Be my refuge to protect me, my defense to save me. Now, does this sound familiar? They'll call on me. In trouble? Is that what he's doing? What did he say he would do? I'll be with him. And what else? I will deliver him. Say that out loud. I will deliver him. Who said it? God said it. He said, you are my refuge and defense. Guide me and lead me as you have promised. Is he wanting protection? Does he recognize that guidance is a big part of it? Verse 4. Keep me safe from the trap that has been set for me. That's today's English version. Shelter me from danger. Now what did he just get through saying? Guide me. Lead me. Keep me safe from the trap that's been set for me. Does God have the power 
to break the trap apart and to get you out of the middle of the trap. Yes, Yes, he does. But that's much more traumatic and really unnecessary when you can just go, up, there's a trap, there's a trap. I'm just going to go around this way. (laughs) So much easier than than getting clamped with this big bear jaw trap and going, oh, God, oh, God, you got to help me, please, please. And then when you finally get free, oh, God, I need healing. Look at these big gashes. So much easier to just go, up, Holy Ghost, go, trap, trap, trap. Oh, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Let's go this way, this way, and go around just this easy, just this easy. No downtime, no healing time, no time spent in the waiting room at the ER. <laughs> Saved all the money, right? How many know there's something better than being healed from being hurt? It's avoiding, completely missing the trap. I'm believing for this. I'm believing for this, for this whole church family. Yes. All Everybody join with us all over the world. E-members, I'm believing. Amen. In fact, I just, I know it in my spirit. When the Lord led me to teach on this, he had it in mind. Amen. 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 And his word does not return void. It will prosper. Amen. It will accomplish what he sent it to do. And I just know in my spirit that thousands of us, and multiplied beyond that later on as the word gets out. Because we're going to send this word to other folks. Right. At no charge. Right. right? And many, many, many will be alerted. And warned. And they'll recognize the warning. And they'll heed the warning. And they'll miss the traps that the enemy had laid for them. Keep me safe from the trap that's been set for me. Well, who set it for them? Who's, the, who's your enemy? The devil. Shelter me from danger. I place myself in your care. You will save me, Lord. You are a faithful God. Oh, hallelujah. How many believe that? Glory to God. Now, go to 1 Kings. This was the thing I was wanting to get to tonight. I think we ought to go ahead and get to it. 1 Kings, I believe it's the 13th chapter. How does God protect us? Let's back up a little bit. We've, we've seen how does he protect us? This uh, canopy of protection, this, this power of his, right? Also by his angels, right? And now also by warnings. First Kings and the... Uh, Let's see. First Kings 13, that's correct. Now when God warns us, do we have to heed it? Do we have to listen to it or can we ignore it? You can ignore it. Just, just like any man or woman warning you. You could ignore their warnings. You can do the same thing with God warning you. Can it cost you? Oh, man. How many times you ever heard, even out of your own mouth, I knew better than that. I knew I shouldn't have done that. I knew I shouldn't have gone there today. I knew. Well, if you knew, <laughs> why did you override it? Why did you ignore it? So I'm convinced the, the big issue with Christians is not with God not warning It's with Christians ignoring warnings. Everybody say ignoring. Ignoring. And Christians overriding warnings. Everybody say ignoring. Ignoring. And overriding. overriding. Too many are not taught to pay attention to what they get on the inside. Too many live too carnally. Too many, they've trained their mind, but their spirit is weak. 
And so they make all the decisions based on their understanding, which is severely limited. I don't care how smart you think you are, how much you think you know, your understanding compared to what you need to know is severely limited. You will never know enough to make all the right decisions based on what you know. For one thing, what do you know about the future? Precious little. But there's somebody in you who knows the end from the beginning, right? Who knows everything about the enemy's plans and tactics and snares and traps and thank God knows his wonderful plan. There's only one way you can be right again and again. That's be led. Not by your head. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and don't lean to your own understanding. If this is new to you, don't let it get away from you. Get materials. We got some free ones out in the, in the Word Supply about spirit-led life. Tapes and tapes and CDs and CDs. Find out how you can be led every day by the Spirit of God inside you. A lot of, Brother Hagen has a good book called How to Be Led by the Spirit. A lot of people have good materials. Find out about it. Feed on it. One of the most important things you could ever learn in this life. Yes. Answer to a thousand and one questions every day is... Be led. What does that mean? You best find out. <laughs> Your life depends on it. Learn how to be led by the Spirit. How many that have learned at least a little about, a bit about it, you would agree and testify and say it's one of the most important things you could ever learn in this life Absolutely. is how to be led not by intellect, not by reasoning, not by flipping coins, not by asking 50 people what they think you ought to do. Learn how to look inside where God lives on the inside of you Amen. and be led, not by voices and feelings, by the witness, the knowing. Well, when he warns us, we should pay attention to it, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Don't ignore it. Pay attention to it. Somebody say, don't ignore the warning. Don't ignore the warning. Pay, attention. pay attention. Heed it. Check it out. Follow it through. Well, if you're in too big of a rush, you're too big of a hurry, you got too much natural stuff going on, you can ignore it, run on through it. And that's when people get messed up and they go, man, I knew I, knew I shouldn't have. I knew. Well, why didn't you listen? It's not okay that you didn't listen. This time, maybe it cost you a car wreck. Maybe it cost you an expense, a, a new fender. Next time, it could be your life. Did you hear me? Or a child. It is, it is not smart to ignore warnings, checks we have. Because why would you even think about it? Why would it even come up? Most of the time it doesn't. Hmm? But when something comes up, don't ignore it. Don't cast it down. Don't treat it lightly. Check it out. And then there's another thing. People who know that they're supposed to be led by the Spirit, even people who are spiritual and quite sensitive and quite aware of God and know, know that it was God, frequently override it anyway. You got time for me to talk to you about this? In this chapter, you see one of the clearest examples of this in the Word. Verse 1, 1 Kings 13, 1, the, uh, the man who has become king of Israel, not king of Judah, king of Israel that has split and separated from Judah was afraid that his people would go to Jerusalem and, and get to worshiping with the other Jewish people and leave him. So he had, took counsel, bad counsel, and made some golden calves. Always a bad idea. <laughs> and uh, told the people, people, these are your gods. Worship right here. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You, you worship right here. We got your gods right here. Got you some new ones. New shiny gods. And so anyway, they're in trouble with God, as you might imagine. 
And verse 1, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethlehem, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and he said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon you shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense on you, and men's bones will be burnt on you. And he gave him a sign that same day. He said, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar will be rent, and the ashes that are on it will be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God which had cried against the altar in Bethel that he put forth his hand from the altar and he said, Lay hold on him. In other words, arrest him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. And the altar also was rent and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Powerful, spectacular, immediate manifestation of the power of God on this day. The place was shaken. The kingdom was shaken. The king answered and said to the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. He was ready to kill him. Now he wants him to pray for him. Things can change quickly. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before him. Oh, the mercy of God. And this man did not repent. He did not repent of his idolatry. He did not repent of his ungodly ways. On that moment, he cried out and asked for mercy. God had mercy on him. The king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. The man of God said to the king, If you will give me half your house, I will not go in with you, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the way that you came. Is he clear about what the Lord told him? Huh? No ambiguity here. No no vagueness saying, You know, I, I... picked up some things last night and I kind of had this check about staying here or eating with y'all. I, I don't know. We're going to No, no, no. Crystal clear. Right? Yes. The word of the Lord came to me. Yes. This is beyond a perception. This is the ministry of the prophet. He may have heard it. It might have been to him an audible voice and he knew it was God. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. See, that's what the Lord told uh, uh, the kings, that, uh, the, the wise men that came, told them to go back another way. Remember that? And it was to protect uh, Jesus, protect them. And uh, so he went another way. He's doing what the Lord told him to do. And he returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now there dwelt an old prophet. Now it's giving a difference here. You'll see later on this man was called a young prophet. An old prophet in Bethel. His sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. And the words that he had spoken to the king. Them they told also to their father. And their father said to them, what way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said to his sons, saddle me the ass. They saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God that came from Judah? He said, I am. He said to him, come home with me and eat bread. Why is everybody wanting him to come eat with them today? Huh? When the Lord tells you something? Hmm? Hmm? The enemy will come and try to get you off of it. Why is everybody wanting him to come eat with them today? When that's the very thing the Lord told him don't do. Verse 16. He said, I may not return with you, nor go in with you, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. Is he confused about it? 
Hmm. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall eat no bread nor drink water there nor turn again to go by the way that you came. Is he clear? Does he know what the Lord told him? Did the Lord warn him, don't do this? He knows it. He knows it's God. He knows what he said to him. Sounds kind of like the beginning of the book. When the enemy came and said, did God say? Hmm? Uh-huh. They, weren't, they weren't confused. Yes, God has said, you, you don't eat of the fruit of that tree. In, in the day you do, you'll die. They knew it. And yet what? They overrode it. They overrode what they knew he had said. This is dangerous. Now look what happens. Verse 18, he said to him, the old prophet, I am a prophet also as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord and said, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. Why would he do that? Why? Why would the Lord have told this prophet, the young prophet, that specific thing? Don't you have a meal with anybody. Don't you go back with anybody. Why? This king is ungodly. These people don't even worship God anymore. They worship molten images. Ungodly. And the Lord is very displeased with them. And this man represents God. Hmm? And when they're inviting him, it's like they're inviting the Lord. And the Lord said, I'm not eating with them right now. And I'm not fellowshipping with them right now. Did you hear me? You leave there? Don't you... Now see what, the the king has gotten healed. He's ready to throw the man in jail and execute him. Now he wants to bring him home and let's have a big meal. Why? Because he is popular right now. He he has rock star status right now. This, This story is going through the nation like wildfire. All these witnesses saw this man speak these words and the power of God shake that thing and tear it apart and this man was leprous and now he's he's healed. And I mean, this is amazing. Signs and wonders. He goes from wanting to kill the man to wanting to cash in on his credibility and his popularity. Are you with me? And people who don't know God and don't care want to use people who do. And the Lord knew that and and he didn't want them. He didn't want him to give his credibility to anybody by going with them or being involved with them. So he said, You say what I tell you to, and then you get out of there. You go home another way. Don't you eat with anybody. Don't you go home with anybody. You, you know, uh, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You you, you go right home. Yeah, Yeah, but you're so popular right now. The king wants to wine and dine you. Everybody wants to see you. Here's the old prophet. Now, if you read the rest of the story, you see this man really was a prophet. That's right. You must have said a lion prophet? Yeah. <laughs> he, he had known the prophecy of God. He had known it. This is my thinking. I think the man has gotten cold. Did you hear me? And away from God. He knows the power of God. Previous life and previous experience. And he hears about it. And he sees it in this young man. And it stirs him up. And he wants it. And he lies. 
Just because a man or woman has legitimately been used of God doesn't mean that everything they say for the rest of their life is right. An apostle can lie. A prophet can lie. A pastor can lie. A teacher can lie. Just like you can lie. Why'd they do it? Well, why'd you? <laughs> Biggest problem with ministers is that they're like you. Human. Natural. They can yield to the flesh. He lied to this man. And this man believed it. And overrode the warning of the Lord. Is it true? He went back with him. He ate bread in his house. He drank water. It came to pass as they're sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet, the old prophet that had lied to him. Now here comes a real word to this man that just lied a while back. He says, I don't understand that. Well, there's a lot you don't understand. Don't mean it's not true. A man can yield to the Lord and turn around and yield to the enemy. Yield to the flesh. It's not good, but it can happen. He said, Thus says the Lord, for as much as you have disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back and you ate bread and drunk water in the place which the Lord told you, eat no bread and drink no water, your carcass shall not come to the sepulcher of your fathers. Now this young prophet probably did not assume that mean he's going to die today. Your body is not going to come to the family cemetery. That could mean you're going to live another 50 years, 80 years, and then be buried somewhere else. It could mean a lot of things. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, he saddled for him the ass to it for the prophet which he brought back. He put him in his car, you know, and sent him, probably feeling bad, wasn't he? And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it, and the lion stood by the carcass, and men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass, and they came told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. So that's a sign. The lion didn't kill him because he's hungry. The lion would have ate the man and or the donkey. The donkey would have run away when the lion roared. The man's laying there dead, the prophet. The lion just sitting there looking at him. The donkey's sitting there looking at him. They just said, that's a sign. Right? The man got judged. Now he's laying, his body's laying there dead. Why is his body dead right now? Why? Was it the will of God? No. No. The plan, what was the will of God? For him to be back at his house by now. Eating his food with a lot of useful life and ministry in front of him. Why is, he, why is the man dead? A legitimate man of God used to shake a nation on that very day. Talk about power, anointing, dead, young. Why? He didn't just ignore a warning. He knew what God told him, didn't he? He overrode it based on what somebody else said they got from God. Oh, come on, did you hear that now? They, oh, he overrode it based on what somebody else said. And here, the one thing I think that kind of took him off guard was this man, he probably recognized he was a legitimate prophet, or at least had been. And the man looked at him and told him, yeah, but God told me something else that supersedes what he told you. And so he overrode it. And now he's dead. How does God protect us? Warnings, but do you have to heed them? And even when you know them, you can't override them, but that's foolish. And when the prophet that brought him back the way heard it, he went, this is 26, get this, get this. The prophet that brought him back from the way heard, he said, 
It's the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. And that's why the Lord delivered him to the lion which has torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord which he spoke to him, in other words, through me. He said, yes, yeah, that disobedient prophet, you know. Uh-huh. You know, the Lord spoke through me at the table. You remember that? Right. See, now he's back on top of his game. Uh-huh. <laughs> he's the prophet of the hour now. He's, his prophecy just came to pass. Never mind, there wouldn't have been a prophecy, and the man would still be alive if he wasn't a liar. So he got his donkey and he rode out there, found the carcass in the way and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass nor torn the ass. That's supernatural. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God, laid him upon the ass, brought it back, and the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave. And they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. I'm sure he felt responsible. And it came to pass after he had buried him that he spoke to his sons. He said, when I'm dead, bury me in the sepulcher where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying that he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. His prophecy that he spoke will come to pass. I wanted us to look at this and take the time to go over it because it is such an example of overriding a warning that God gave you. Don't do it. I don't know how many times I've had people come to me and say, you know, I just feel led that you should do this or that. You feel led that I should do. (laughs) You hear that kind of thing all the time, don't you? And, and, And you see people that will let other folks talk them out of what they know in their heart. And ignore it and override it. You had a check about something, and then your friend comes along and says, Oh, come on, come on, we got it all planned. Come on, you got to go. Yeah, but I had this little, oh, you know, what? why? Why? Can you explain it to me? What reason do you have? And you don't have a reason except the big reason that you got a check. Don't raise your hand, but have you ever let somebody talk you into something that you knew better in your heart? You, you had a check, you had a warning. But you let somebody talk yet? Well, then we can't throw stones at this young man. Hmm? He overrode the warning. And it cut him off. It cost him. Wasn't the plan of God. Said out loud, I will not not do this. this. I will trust trust what God gives me. me. I will follow it it. in Jesus' name. Stand up on your feet, please.